Uh, let me introduce the debaters. Uh, first, Barry Brummett. He is the Charles Sapp Centennial Professor in Communication and Chair of the Department of Communication at the University of Texas, Austin. An expert in the rhetoric of popular culture, his books include The World and How We Describe It, Contemporary Apocalyptic Rhetoric, and A Rhetoric of Style. For the past three decades, he has explored the relations between rhetoric and social struggle, examining, among other phenomena, the rhetorical disguises that debates about religion take in the non-sectarian American university. In Uncovering Hidden Rhetorics, he writes that, and I quote him, religion is powerful not because it is a mystic supernatural phenomenon, rather it is powerful because it can be an ordering device that helps us, tells us who we should be and how we should respond to other people. Please welcome the first of your two debaters, Barry Brummett. And in his 40-year career, Anglo-American journalist and critic Christopher Hitchens has witnessed many of the late 20th century and early 21st century's major global conflicts. The experiences animate his countless columns for Slate, Vanity Fair, and The Atlantic, as well as writing the 2007 bestseller you may know, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. His latest book, Hitch 22, a memoir, combines his lifelong engagement with world affairs and an interest that motivated some of his earliest publications, the writers and writing that influenced his own intellectual life. In the foreword to his year 2000 essay collections, uh, a collection, Unacknowledged Legislation, Writers in the Public Sphere, dedicated, by the way, to Salman Rushdie, he offers a characteristically memorable reason why it's impossible to think about culture and political upheaval without recourse to the irony and wit of great literary minds. And I quote Mr. Hitchens, there are things that pens can do and swords cannot. Every tank, as Bertolt Brecht once said, has a crucial flaw, its driver. Suppose that driver has read something good lately. More recently, Mr. Hitchens has declared literature and art the rightful subjects of the attention that sacred texts have usurped from them and the only true vessels of the eternal ethical questions that humanity keeps asking. He is joining us tonight from Washington, D.C. Please welcome Mr. Christopher Hitchens. Mr. Hitchens, it's good to see you again. I just want to make sure you can hear us okay. You can hear me? Yes, indeed. Fantastic. And, right. and, and, you, and you, I, or me? Can't hear a word you just said. We can hear you just fine. Fantastic. Uh, it's the nasty man. Um, before we begin, uh, begin a, a word about the debates organization. So each of you are debaters will have a maximum of 10 minutes to make your opening statements. So you'll each get a 10 minute opening statement. This will be followed by two rounds of rebuttals to allow both speakers to respond to the other's statements. So an opening statement of 10 minutes and then two rounds of approximately five minute rebuttals. At the end of these rounds, we're gonna take a questions from the audience and in the final 10 minutes of the debate, you'll each have five minutes to give a closing statement. Any questions? Mr. Hitchens, Dr. Brennan? Okay. Okay, I'm going to ask Christopher Hitchens to speak first, uh, if that is okay with you, sir, and then we'll, in the closing statements, have Dr. Brummett speak first. Is that all right with you? For me, yes, that's fine. Okay. Well, in that case, Christopher Hitchens, your first, your opening statements, take it away. Bring it on. Um, well, first, I should congratulate you on your anniversary. And uh, second, thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. 
I was born in Portsmouth, Hampshire, in the little town outside where, near where we live, was called Waterloo. Ville, nice little place if you're in that part of Hampshire. And when I later went to Oxford University, I was kept going in part by a Kitchener scholarship. So it would have been especially nice for me to be with you this evening. Um, let me see how I want to inaugurate this. Um, I think I'll start in, in Prague, if I may, a few years ago, where I went in order to meet uh, Vaslav Havel, Mikhail Baryshnikov, and um, Larry Flint, the publisher of Hustler, all in the same room at the same time. It's a great story. I'll tell you all of it one day. Um, Prague is a spectacularly beautiful city, as you know. And I remember one evening walking across the Charles Bridge from the castle, made famous by Kafka, in the company of Mikhail Baryshnikov and a very beautiful young woman named Carol Blue, famous for her chant, and wishing that Larry Flint could be with us, because otherwise I was so obviously going to be the most ugly feature of the landscape. And it was such a treat that I'd arranged to bring my family along, and my wonderful, tough-minded, secular mother-in-law said to me the next day as we strolled through the gorgeousness of the city, so wise guy, how come that all this wonderful architecture and all this beauty and civilization was given to us by people who believed in God? Very fair question, very searchingly asked. And I thought, well, that's true. Um, that we owe that much. But it's also true that we couldn't have had that art and that architecture without the feudal system, without monarchy, and without theocracy. And who would want to say that it was necessary in order to appreciate culture that we should also revere uh, those progenitors of it? I think you'd have to, to factor in a couple of other things too, at least a couple of other things. Uh, Prague, the old town square, in fact, is the place where Jan Hus, the famous Protestant dissident, was uh, burned alive. The conflicts that were raging about what kind of faith we should be holding in those days led to the Thirty Years' War, the, the most devastating war Europe had then seen, led to a tremendous destruction of culture and civilization in the name of God um, and because of faith, as well as, of course, the terrifying uh, loss of Life. This has to be, I think, part of the uh, calculus as well. Um, St. Peter's Rome, for example, actually not my favorite building. I think it's rather oppressive, rather too much designed to show who's boss. It contains some wonderful works of art, but I think it's a bit vulgar in itself. That, by the way, suppose you like it more than I do. Does it change your mind to know that it was built by the money raised from a very special sale of indulgences. The, the horrible and corrupt and superstitious system whereby people who could afford it could pay to have their, their time in purgatory or possibly in the inferno shortened. Uh, by, by the way, using the same units of time, by years, uh, it was assumed that those measurements would apply in the afterlife as well, in, in exchange for lavish donations to holy of the church. In the end, that system proved so repulsive that even Christianity had to repudiate it. Now, how can we honestly settle the question? Could you do without St. Peter's if you knew that there were indulgences at the core of it as a foundation stone? Would you, if you knew that, still continue to appreciate it in the same way? Could you have skipped either or skipped both? I suggest these questions are, in fact, probably insoluble, but very well worth discussing if we can do it in a clarifying manner. And I'm going to have to put on my glasses now because I want to read, I don't trust myself to quote it properly, a, a paragraph from T.S. Eliot's wonderful essay, Christianity and Culture. Um, just bear with me while I uh, read it to you. It is in Christianity that our arts have developed. It is in Christianity that the laws of Europe, have, until recently, have been rooted. It is against a background of Christianity that all of our thought has significance. An individual European may not believe that the Christian faith is true, and yet what he says and makes and does will all spring out of his heritage of Christian culture and depend upon that culture for its meaning. I do not believe the culture of Europe could survive the complete disappearance of the Christian faith. And I am convinced of that, not merely because I'm a Christian myself, 
but as a student of social biology. If Christianity goes, the whole culture goes. I would say that was a pretty fair and eloquent statement of the opposing side to mine in this debate. Again, there's a sense in which that statement's obviously true. None of us can imagine our culture, our heritage, never mind just Europe, North America, and many other places too, without the influence of Christianity or some other monotheism. Um, that's true whether you accept its premises or admire them or not. But it was, it was becoming less true even as Eliot wrote. And it was, um, if that, what I said just there wasn't true, we wouldn't, we wouldn't in fact have his most wonderful poem, The Wasteland which, overrated as it is in many ways, brilliantly evokes the, the despair and fear and uh, trembling and angst that accompanied the terrible trauma inflicted on European civilization by the First World War. Now, if you look up um, Professor Dermot McCullough's new book, History of Christianity, written by a very sophisticated believer, the best book on the, on the general subject, I must say, I've ever read, highly recommend it, he says that it was actually in 1914 that the, that the idea of Christendom, Christian civilization, which could up till then be unironically used, people would speak of Christendom as a, as a real thing, a living, breathing, cultural, human entity, came to an end because the Christian emperors and kings of Europe went to war with each other and did so in such a barbaric way as to usher in a state of not just a total war, but of totalitarian principles in European and global politics. We live, in fact, in the wreckage of what Eliot proposes as true and enduring. And that, that concept of, uh, of Christendom um, is gone. We, we now use the words the Muslim world as if it meant something. It certainly does mean much more to many Muslims than it would do uh, to say, to, to uh, refer to Christendom uh, beforehand. Um, Eliot's own life, as a matter of fact, um, represents a, an attempt to grapple with this compromise. He solved the question of that crisis, the crisis of civilization um, of post-1918, by joining up in effect with a party, the Action Francaise at first, and then other groups in Europe that were nostalgic for monarchy, for feudalism, in part for theocracy, for an orderly, uh, organic society, um, his writing testifies to it in his uh, notorious lecture at the University of Virginia, After Strange Gods, he says probably a proper culture will just have to do without too many secular Jews. A very blunt statement, very offensive to many of his friends, but very sincerely meant. What he meant was our faith is becoming compatible with certain kinds of modernity, certain kinds of pluralism. Now I submit that a religion that has to make that confession in any sense at all, whether whether remorsefully or, or whether, uh, as he did, positively, has confessed that it has not, nothing more to contribute to the cultural argument, has confessed to its exhaustion. So that however true it may have been, that religion was a great contributor to music, uh, to painting, to architecture, um, we have to be aware of a couple of uh, qualifications and modifications to that. I, as a student of literature, would admit that it's very unlikely that the poetry of George Herbert, the devotional poetry, or the poetry and sonnets and um, sermons of John Donne, could have been written by anyone who was insincere about their faith. I think it's incredibly unlikely. But I can't say that of the painters and artists who did the decoration for civilization, because we don't know what they really thought. All we can know for certain, excuse me when I take a sip of water, All we can know for certain is that if they didn't make a profession of faith, they wouldn't get the commission. Everybody knew what happened to those who doubted the faith and the examples of Benjamin Franklin, for example, or uh, James and John Stuart Mill, civilized members of the upper orders in stable and developed societies chose to conceal their own views of the matter because they thought it was too risky. If, if, if they thought that, imagine what it was like in less advanced or more tyrannical countries. And the examples of people having to write in code to get their meaning across, philosophers like Spinoza, for example, permanently aware 
that had the heavy hand of the secular arm of the Inquisition might fall on them, had to conduct themselves. We have, I think, absolutely no right to forget that, to forget the fact that only one copy of Lucretius's De Rerum Naturum, one of the great contributions to culture and civilization ever made, as well as the first discovery of the atomic theory, very nearly didn't survive the Christian centuries at all. Only one copy, in fact, did make it, it helped to inspire people like Galileo, whose fate, of course, stood as a permanent reminder to people of what would happen to them if they, uh, if they didn't appear to be uh, sufficiently devout. So I think if I haven't made that point by now, I'll have failed to make it if I elaborate any further. I think I just want to say, and this should probably be in conclusion, I don't have a stopwatch either, is that we are now in the position that uh, I occupy, try to occupy, in my little book about the Parthenon. Oh, the Parthenon is a building without which I could not do. I don't know about any of you, but if, if you try and imagine European civilization without that, as Eliot invites us to imagine European civilization without monotheism, it's pretty hard to do. A tremendous work and involving largely, this, with some slavery, but not much, largely the work of free citizens, artists and artisans of Athens. Inspired quite clearly by, by, by faith, nobody knows anything about that religion anymore, really. Certainly nobody bothers with those gods, nobody practices the Eleusinian mysteries. That's all gone. But the tremendous contribution made by it stays with us. So what I think we have to be talking about, Professor Brummett and I, among other things, is one of my favorite words, Hegel's word, Auf Hegel, um, transcendence. How do we, as a civilization and a culture, retain what is of value and of beauty and of instruction in the contributions gifted to us by the past from the years and decades and uh, centuries of faith, while discarding, perfect timing, while discarding the, the superstition, the, the theocracy, the censorship, the torture, the intimidation that were at just as necessary to that system and just as much part of its legacy to us. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Christopher Hitchens, thank you very much for your opening statement. Somewhat creative interpretation of 10 minutes, but not, not too far off. Uh, your opening statement, Dr. Barry Brummett. Yes, thank you, and, and what an honor it is to be here today and to share the stage, albeit electronically, with uh, Mr. Hitchens. Um, it is, of course, Mr. Hitchens' uh, long uh, legacy and, and uh, work in attacking the extremisms of religion, uh, which provide the framework for us to be here tonight. Um, so I think my prepared remarks are going to try to address our um, resolution within that context, and then in my uh, five minutes later on, I'll talk more about his, uh, I thought, very interesting statements. At the start of his celebrated uh, treatise on rhetoric, Aristotle makes a very interesting distinction. He says, on the one hand, we have decisions that we have to make for which we have no sure and certain systems to guide us. Who do you vote for? What do I do about my um, um, interpersonal relationships? Do I spank my kid? Do I buy that used car? And he says, because we have no sure and certain systems for those kinds of decisions, we have to talk it out, and that means that we have to turn to rhetoric and dialectic, he said. And I think our descendants' rhetoric and dialectic today would include, although not be limited to, uh, such activities as literature, television, film, and so forth. Many of us uh, get clues as to how to live those um, parts of our lives from those sources. On the other hand, he says, we have decisions to make for which we do have sure and certain systems to guide us. If you want to know the area of a circle, you take a measurement, you apply the formula, no one debates about the area of a circle, okay? Seems like a very reasonable sort of distinction. But I think it sets up a great temptation, and that is the temptation to move managements of our everyday issues from rhetoric and dialectic and, and the messiness that that involves over to sure and certain systems, right? 
Because wouldn't you really like someone to tell you once and for all what you should do in life? Wouldn't you like someone to tell you whether you should spank your child or not? <laughs> Otherwise, you do the wrong thing and then 20 years later the kid climbs a library tower with a 30 out 6 and it's your fault. <laughs> I, take, I take from from this great temptation, what I would call a rhetorical definition of extremism. And I think rhetorically extremism is what happens when people assert that they have a sure and certain system to guide decisions, which really ought to be made uh, through rhetorical and dialectic and, and cultural means. And let me just say in general, I think that uh, having uh, looked at Mr. Hitchens' uh, work over the years, I think I am uh, probably appalled by many of the same things that he is appalled by. But I think I find a different causality. And I want to talk about um, extremisms as being that causality, but not only re religious extremisms. I think uh, extremisms, both religious and secular, are the source of many of our problems. And if I, I think if we don't understand that, then we will not understand religions which are not extremist, and we will not see uh, secular belief systems which are extremist. When I talk about extremism, I, I want to look at the form or the pattern of extremism. I think that's more important than the content of religious or secular uh, extremisms. And I want to point to three kinds of form uh, that I think underlie this sort of extremism. The first is what I would call dogmatic fundamentalism. And that's what happens when someone um, is, is a prophet, when someone has found some sort of uh, secular text, and they attempt to treat that as a sure and certain system which will tell us absolutely what we should uh, do in life. Now, obviously, you, you find that in, in religious circles, uh, um, in religious belief. But I think you find it elsewhere uh, also. And let me just give one sort of example. I've known many people. Um, who began life uh, with a very dogmatic and fundamentalist upbringing. And then later in life, they just couldn't do that anymore. They could not, they could not uh, uh, hold to those religious beliefs. But they shifted that sort of dogmatic fundamentalism to something else. In my experience, most often health. And, and they, they grab hold of some sort of health doctrine and health text, and, and they become as, as dogmatic as, as any primitive Baptist preacher uh, telling you, you know, what, what you should do, except now it's about what you ought to eat as opposed to, to what you ought to believe. So I think dogmatic fundamentalism is the first kind of extremism in the sense that, that I mean it. Secondly, I would point to apocalyptic belief, and I've done... Uh, some research on this, um, an apocalyptic belief is what happens when someone gets hold of some uh, ancient or grounding text and they say, uh, I, I have a sure and certain system for understanding this text and it means the world is going to end next Wednesday. In the United States, at any rate, we just had uh, Harold Camping, uh, a minister, tell us that the world is going to end on May 21st. Um, sadly, for students preparing for final exams, it did not. Um, <laughs> Now he says, well, it's October, 20, uh, uh, October 21st, but this time he really means it. Um, I think that's an extremism, and I think it's um, offering as a sure and certain text something that you really can't know as a sure and certain text. In fact, the Bible says you can't, but that doesn't, that doesn't stop people like the Reverend Camping. Um, in my study of apocalyptic, what has fascinated me, though, is I've looked at all kinds of apocalyptic discourse. People who think the world will end because of World War III, or ecological matters, or economic matters, or, or you name it, and they all follow the same form or pattern. I think this is something deeply ingrained in people. And finally, the tendency towards perfection, or what is sometimes called uh, teleology. Uh, of course, there is no perfection in nature, but people will sometimes uh, give you the, the, the advice as, as to how one uh, can, can perfect oneself. And I think some ways of, of thinking are more disposed toward perfectionism than others. Now here I think Mr. Hitchens is definitely on to something because I think religion is one of those areas which lends itself uh, toward, toward perfectionism, toward thinking that, that, uh, that one can come up with a perfect solution uh, to, to life's problems. But I don't think it's the only one. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a pattern that we find. Well, what's to be done? And again, because this is a, a conference on rhetoric and because I'm a rhetorician, I want to offer three rhetorical solutions as, as to how we can address this problem of extremism, whether we find it in, in uh, uh, religious circles or, or non-religious circles. The first thing is, that I would suggest is to turn to rhetoric's long and somewhat uneven tradition of both affirmation and critique. 
uh, rhetoric has, uh, throughout history, taught people what they ought to say so they can affirm something, so they can defend some sort of proposition, so they can get up in a speech and, and say what they think they believe, but rhetoric has also taught people how to critique and how to think about what is wrong with this proposition, uh, where, where are the holes in this. I think a lot of um, uh, what, what you see in, in, in people who are uh, being extremist for one reason or another, perhaps, is a failure of that second kind of training. But it really is a kind of rhetorical education. And I think people who are in the job of, of educating need to think about how to train people, both how do you say yes, and how do you say I'm not so sure. Second thing is, I think we need to train people in the schools uh, as to how to exploit the resources of ambiguity. Now, religion has a long history of being able to do this very well. It's called casuistry. But any religious system, in fact, any system whatsoever that's going to last for any period of time is going to have ambiguities. And, and, and they provide a way to exploit that system and, and, and to suggest alternative ways of, of thinking. Um, but people need to be trained in, in how to, in how to, to uh, exploit those ambiguities. Um, re religion depends on this. No religion is going to last more than two weeks if it tells you that, you that you must wear a pointed yellow hat every Thursday evening at five o'clock. None of them are that specific. They are all vague. They are all ambiguous. Uh, and, and, so I, and, and exploiting that is, is one way that you can do that. If you want a literary cultural example of that, look at um, Inherit the Wind and look at the ways in which uh, uh, the, the character of uh, Clarence Darrow uh, exploited the uh, ambiguities in William Jennings Bryan's um, fundamentalism. I think that provides a good example. Uh, the last uh, solution I would suggest is to go sophistic. Uh, to become sophist, and the sophist cultivated uh, the study of what was called the disoi logoi, which is to say uh, there are two sides to every question. And uh, before you get up to speak on any question, think about what could be said on the other side of that question. Um, one of my favorite authors, his book is rather old now, but uh, Mark Backman um, wrote a book called Sophistication. I highly recommend it. He argues that we have become sophists in our time. Uh, I would say perhaps not enough and not enough of us. But I think training people to be able to say that whatever it is that you affirm, whatever it is that, that you uh, are inclined to visit upon other people as this is a, a true way to think, stop and ask yourself, what's the other way to think? What's, what could be said on the other side? And that's, that's very much a rhetorical way of thinking. Always think about what can be said on, on both sides of, of the question. Uh, again, I, I think I'll reserve for my uh, second statement some, uh, some answers to what, what I thought were uh, uh, Mr. Hitchens' very interesting and uh, provocative remarks. Um, and I will, I will now yield the rest of my time, as they say. Well, you just, uh, you came in at 9.56, so you yielded four seconds, but that was quite remarkable. Either you're, uh, uh, you're very, very good at timing your, your comments, or you're very lucky, but uh, well done. There are your opening statements. So uh, our second round is five-minute moments uh, of rebuttal, so it's quite obvious the way this is going to play out. Mr. Hitchens for five minutes, Mr. Brummett for five minutes, and then once again. So, uh, Mr. Hitchens, I go to you for five minutes, sir. All right. Um, if you notice, the examples I adduce of um, religions often hostile, attitude to culture or to what makes it possible, which is independent thought, uh, free inquiry and freedom of expression, is not a matter of extremists. All the examples I adduced were from the mainstream practice of the religious establishment of civilized Europe for many, many centuries. Um, I don't believe I instanced any hedge priests or Savonarola types or anything of this sort. These were, these were statements or positions, policies that had the force of something more than moral law for millions of people and were enforceable. Um, I sometimes grow tired of those who seek to say, yes, well, there are extremists and fundamentalists and there are things, terrible things are done and said in the name of religion or sometimes in the name of God. It's not in the name of. It's not a hijacking of. It's in the text 
Professor Bromwich, I'm sure, won't disagree. If we take his, his chosen field um, in his opening statement of eschatology, the study of the end of days, um, it's easy enough to attribute things like that to some crackpot uh, cleric and uh, false calculator and obviously bad astronomer and mathematician in, in the United States who, you know, in common with William Miller and all the others before him and the Trevor's witnesses, think they can actually assign a date to it. You'll notice they also do it with tremendous relish. It's not saying this will be a terrible thing. They, they can't wait for it to happen. Actually, insofar as it involves having them raptured off the planet and snatched up um, into the sky. I personally wish it would happen too. I can't wait for them all to go. Um, but though there were many people at the time who argued that perhaps the book of Revelation shouldn't make it into the final cut of the Bible, and actually Martin Luther had grave reservations to the end of his life as to whether that was really the revelation of the word of God or not. The book of Revelation is there canonically present, and it's there to be referred to as an authority by religious people at any time they may choose. Who, um, if I was to give you the following statement and then ask you who made it, I wonder what would happen. Here's the statement. Who made it and when? I'm sorry, I should add. A nuclear holocaust, so this person, uh, would have no terrors for us. It would be no more than the wholesale ushering of our species into a better future to which it is in any case uh, destined to go. Now, who would like to take a, a shot at saying, at guessing who said that? You would perhaps want to say it was the Ayatollah Khomeini on a particularly grumpy day. And then indeed there are people, not just extremists by the way, but members of important governments who have made statements of that kind very recently in Pakistan. So actually, the end of days, if it took that form, would be, would be a welcome thing. God would know his own. Uh, the, the, the proper survivors would survive it. For the rest of us, it would just be too bad. But the statement I opened by quoting was made by the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1960, in a very important intervention, I think in a debate in the British House of Lords. So I rather tend to bristle when people say, oh, well, you, you can't just pick on the extremists and fundamentalists. First, I don't do that. Second, it may not be denied that the, the uh, positions they take have scriptural and textual warrant to them. Um, talk to the most liberal or supposedly liberal Muslim you can find. The one who hopes for coexistence, who says I'm a moderate Muslim and all the rest of it. Can you get him in public to say that the Hadith, which have equal standing as religious authority with the Quran, in Muslim belief, do not contain the injunction, unqualified, un, un, uh, unsoftened injunction, that apostasy, the abandonment of the Muslim faith or the adoption by a Muslim of another faith, even worse, isn't punishable by death. You can't get them to say it. Because if they were to admit it, they'd have to say that something in the Hadith was not just morally wrong, but wrong. Um, well, lots of luck trying. The problem is in the text to begin with. Now, in my book, um, God is Not Great, I credit religion with, among other things, giving us our first experience of literature and textual authority and, indeed, textual criticism in, in the Bible. It was our first attempt at taking the written word seriously. Well, I was going to add that it was also our first attempt at astronomy, um, cosmology, healthcare, and a number of other things. Um, but I have to compress that and simply say that just because it's first doesn't necessarily make it original or authentic. The first try is very often the worst try. And in this case, I think that that principle would apply also. Thank you, Dr. Brummett. Yes, Mr. Hitchens' uh, hope that the rapture would clear some of the rascals out reminds me of the statement that Mark Twain made, which he said, when I think of uh, some of the disagreeable people who have died and gone to heaven, I am moved to lead a different life. 
Uh, Mr. Hitchens began early in, in his most recent statement, I think, with a very interesting point, uh, if I understood him correctly. He's arguing that he's not talking about extremists because he's talking about uh, uh, grand institutions, and that was not his, his terminology, but I, I think that that's what he meant. These, he's, he said he's talking about governments, he's talking about established churches, he's talking about established uh, religions, and therefore, I think, was the point that he was making, uh, that's not extremism. I don't take extremism to mean the same thing as an outsider. I think it is certainly possible for an institution uh, to, to be extremist in the sense that, that I laid out at the start of, of my remarks, which is uh, asserting there are sure and certain systems for matters which really ought to be talked out in, instead. So I, I think that may be a difference between us, and perhaps that's... that's um, Worth, uh, worth exploring, but also in his first statement when he uh, listed a number of the complaints that, that he had in mind, he talks about feudalism, he talks about the monarchy, he talks about the Thirty Years' War, he talks about St. Peter and, and the papacy and so forth. Uh, of course these are not outsiders, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are not extremists. In fact, I would argue that in many of these cases, what you have is a case of people who are already in, in an empowered uh, position and, and what they uh, essentially are doing is they are trying to find uh, religious trapping so as to keep that, that power going, so as to perpetuate that power. I think people are Italian aristocrat, uh, people are, or I should say were in his examples, they were Italian aristocrats and Northern European warmongers first, and they decided that Christianity, Christianity would be a good way to, to justify uh, their, their rapaciousness. And I, um, I, I would punctuate that a little bit uh, differently than, than he did. Um, he also uh, says that, that the people that he complains of, and, and again, I'm annoyed by the same people, I think, that they do have scriptural basis for what they are doing. Sure they do, but that doesn't mean they're not extremist in, in the sense that, that uh, I laid out that, that definition as, as I would propose it. Uh, you can take the scriptural basis for almost any religion and you can justify almost any uh, code of conduct from it. The question is do you justify it um, by, by extremist means by saying that this provides us with a sure and certain system for, for belief or do you say here is a text that, that we need to wrestle with uh, because the Bible says both that you should take your swords and ble beat them into plowshares and it also says you should take your plowshares and beat them back into swords. You can quote either one depending on, on your mood and the political and social purposes that, that, that you want to serve. Um, I think it's I think it's important to recognize that ambiguity, to get back to one of my uh, uh, solutions that I proposed, I think it's important to, uh, to recognize that ambiguity in religious texts, and I quite agree that, that many people do not, and those are the people of whom I think both of us uh, would complain, those, those who take those religious texts as if they offered a sure and certain system. Now, that, let me just say it, that doesn't mean that, that one... Uh, is necessarily an extremist if one believes in God or Allah or, or um, you, you name it. I think there's a difference between thinking that there must be some sort of higher power, there must be some sort of spiritual dimension to life, there's a difference between thinking that and thinking that I have a sure and certain system that can get at knowledge of that rather than thinking that, that uh, this is something that, that we need to talk about, this is something we need to hash out, this is something that we, we need to work out among ourselves as people because after all, we're not, uh, we're not saints, we're not God, we, we don't have uh, uh, direct uh, access, although, of course, uh, many people do. So, so I, I think that, or think they do. Uh, so so I, think, I think that, um, uh, I think that's a, a, th those are some important uh, differences between us uh, just in terms of what we have said so far. Four seconds? No, you've got a good 24 seconds. Good 24. That's okay. I'll, I'll pass it on to Mr. Hitchens. All right. Good. Um, Professor Bromit again correctly says that anyone can look at any religious text and take any prompting or authority from it that they like for any number of sides of any proposition. That again seems to me to be true to the point of obviousness, but to show something that I assert at the very beginning, which is the religion is man-made, and that it shows. 
God did not make man. A single creator did not make us. Our species, mankind, instead made and continues to make many hundreds and thousands of gods, again in the hope, the vain hope, of certainty, and in some cases in the hope of being able to establish a secular tyranny of rule by men over men, uh, but to say that, that these men have divine warrant for what they do, um, which has led, as you know, to the stifling and near destruction of um, civilization. Now, if you don't believe that uh, there is a creator, if you don't believe that God made me, if you don't believe the first proposition is the correct one, I don't see in what sense at all you are religious. And so I again resent the idea or the imputation of extremism. It is the, it is the essence of religion to say that there is a creator and that, that we may not know his mind entirely, we may interpret his wishes, and that these can be conveyed by a priesthood to other humans. That's the mainstream belief, that's the essential core of the thing. If you don't believe it, and I don't, then in a very non-extreme way, you've ceased to be a religious person. But I say, man made gods and not the other way around. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hitchens. <laughs> well, in the interests of fairness, uh, Professor Brahman, do you wish to call back time and Take 30 seconds to... Well, just five seconds. I, I fear I may have, have uh, been unclear or, or be misunderstood. I'm not at all accusing Mr. Hitchens of, of extremism. I'm saying the people who uh, he is annoyed by, I think, are, are extremists. I, I, think, I think he's... No, but that's just what I wasn't saying. Uh, that's just what I wasn't saying. That's why it's turning into a debate. Extremist. That's that's good. All right. Yeah. You did, Professor, you did not call me an extremist. I wouldn't particularly have bristled if you had, but you carefully refrained from doing so. What you did, which made me bristle even more, was to say that the examples of religios religiosity that I adduce are extremist beliefs. Now, they're not. All the ones I've offered you are the mainstream, essential ABC of religion, the first of which is that in the beginning God created the cosmos. To the contrary, I say, um, the gods that we've made are exactly the gods you'd expect to be made by a species that's about half a chromosome away from being chimpanzee. Okay. Um, Glad to clear that up. Uh, I, I, um, I, I do want to go to audience questions. I'm a bit confused. Um, and you'll forgive me for asking what may be a couple of naive questions, but... Um, we're debating the re resolution, religion has been a positive force in culture. Some of what's been said has completely confused me. Uh, let, me let me see if I can uh, ask either of you a question to get to, to understand where, what you're saying. Uh, Mr. Hitchens, first to you, when, when you talked about your mother-in-law, that was an anecdote that I could really relate to. I, get, I understand your mother-in-law because Whilst I'm confused or have, might have my issues with religion, I, I do understand her question, which is, look at this architecture that you're looking at. This was created, as you say, for, from people who believe in God. And, yes. then, and then your response was, yes, but it was also created by the monarchy and the feudal system and all kinds of uh, um, uh, systems and, and organizations and, and institutions that we can find heinous things about or that you disagree with. You also said at another point that it, it may be true that religion has created great music or literature or, or, or uh, paintings, you said. Um, so I just want to get this straight. So are you saying on balance, because there is enough negative that you see in religion, we should not acknowledge the positive and the beautiful building that your mother-in-law pointed out? Well, no, I'd rather hope to leave the question open uh, to make it part of the warp and woof of our discussion. I said, you know, would you? I, 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 I did it, as Professor Gromit might agree, rhetorically. Um, knowing what we know about the building um, of St. Peter's by the state of indulgences, would it be sensible to ask, could you have had one without the other? Can the two be disallocated and considered separately, or, or are they inseparable? It's an important question, because if religion is going to take credit for these things, then it has to take responsibility for the other ones too. 
And I haven't noticed a very marked tendency to do that on their part. One could add, I mean, for example, and I mentioned that we don't know what the motive of many people was uh, who did painting and music, because we, we, all we know is they would have been very afraid of not being thought faithful, and with good reason. For example, Giuseppe Verdi was a non-believer. We happened in his case, we happen to know about a great composer. Didn't believe in God. Didn't prevent him from writing an absolutely wonderful requiem. So it's a question of to what extent these two things uh, and related ones too are contingent upon one another. I don't have a settled view of that. That's why I, I ended on the Parthenon saying I think that the cultural task is to transcend um, by argument, by cultural philosophical reflection, um, the legacy of religion to say that we can have the Parthenon without the belief in Pallas Athena, without the, the cult of Eleusis, without the probability that some of the friezes on the Parthenon actually display a human sacrifice or the preparation for one. Without Athenian imperialism, we can discard that and keep what is of lasting and enduring value. That, for me, at any rate, is the great cultural undertaking of our time. But that the flip side may also be true, that we can have all of those things and that they did come from faith. Is, I mean, isn't, if, you, if you say we don't know, and it may be true that none of this did emerge out of, out of religion, then, then the opposite is true as well, is it not? We well, don't know? Professor Brummett, again, Professor Brummett, in, in responding to me, said, yes, okay, there, there were some barbarous warlords and monarchs and so forth, but they adopted Christianity opportunistically. Again, I think that's so true as to be almost obvious. We don't know about the Christian message because of what happened um, during the execution of a, of a charismatic rabbi um, in the, under the government of Pontius Pilate. We would never have heard about it if it wasn't for a later emperor of that empire, the emperor Justinian, and later the emperor Constantine, adopting it as official dogma of the Roman Empire. That's how it comes to us. And those, of course, were opportunistic conversions. Uh, it was a Protestant king, King Henry, who agreed to convert to Catholicism to, to gain um, the throne and control of Paris, and his remark that Paris is worth a mass uh, stays with us, I think, for an excellent reason. It just goes to underline and emphasize what I said before. This is all man-made. It all proceeds from unresolved contradictions in the material world. The dialectic, as you might say. Okay. Uh, Professor... Uh, uh Brahman, let me ask you now a question based on your presentation. Um, once again, back to the resolution, religion has been a, a positive force in culture. So you've talked at great length about extremism. Um, and, and your argument seems to, and you, and you talked about the three strands, dogmatic, fun, uh, dogmatic fundamentalism, apocalyptic belief, and a tendency towards perfection, you said. Um, and then you talked about some solutions and uh, antidotes and... Uh, What's the other way to think as a way? Um, and your argument seems to be extremism is not limited to religion, but I don't understand where that fits in terms of the question at hand. Is religion, a, a, has religion been a positive force in culture? Well, the reason why I didn't take that up with a straight yes or no is because I think the answer is it depends. And I think it depends for, for the reasons that, that, uh, um, that I tried to cover. Um, I, I think it's complicated. A um, number of people in, in the days preceding this uh, uh, talked to me about the debate, and I kept saying, uh, I'm not sure it's going to be a debate. I think it's going to be a, a dialogue. I think it's going to be a conversation, which I'm very glad to see has turned out to be that way, um, despite some dis disagreements. So my answer would, would be that, that it, it depends. And I think it's, it's uh, whether uh, religion takes, uh, uh, takes on an extremist form or not. Um, let, me, let me also just add, though, the, the point that I made, I, I think, in my last um, response, which is that uh, when we talk about culture in the sense that the, the resolution puts it, I think we need to think about not just high art, not just high culture, but what effect has religion, whether extremist or not extremist, had on, on people's everyday culture, on, on, on popular culture, and, and, um, and, and how people um, live their everyday lives in that way. 
Um, I was only picking up on that, the yep. definition of culture based on uh, Mr. Hitchens' anecdote, but, but, uh, but if I modify the question slightly, mm -hmm. <laughs> then will you be able to answer it? If I say, can religion be a positive force in culture, what would your answer be? I would say it depends on, on what you mean by... <laughs> I'm an academic, I'm paid to do this kind of thing. It, it depends on what you mean by religion. Mr. Hitchens is entirely correct to say that, that, um, that, that the, the religious systems that we're talking about are human-made. Absolutely they are. Um, that, which says nothing about whether they are extremist or not I extremist uh, uh, systems. So uh, I, think, I think it's a very complicated question. I think it's a very naughty question. Uh, I, I'm not sure there's, there's a clear answer. I think it depends on the form that... that uh, uh, that religion takes. I think um, that there are forms of religion that have, have produced culture that is not necessarily extremist because those forms of religion are not necessarily extremist. I don't think religion has to be extremist, although as I said, I think Mr. Hitchens is definitely correct to warn us about the perils here because I think I think religion has the temptation to, to, to skew extremist. Uh, for a number of reasons. So we need to be on our guard for that. But I don't think it has to be. So I'm going to weasel out of the question yet again by saying I think it depends. I think actually uh, we got an answer in between the disclaimers. I think there was, a, there was something in there. I, I want to just, if you want to, uh, I want to open this up to the audience at this point. So just put your hand up and I will come to you. In the meantime, Mr. Hitchens, I just want uh, to ask you if you have any rebuttal to what you just heard, that, that exchange and what Professor Brummett just said. Well, I don't want to be the one who stands between um, the audience and its question time. I don't, know, I don't know how well off we are for time. We're doing pretty well. I, you, would, you, I, you, would, I you, think I would want to say one thing, though, if I might, which is this, because the, 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 the third leg of, of um, Professor Bromit's proposition, that, that of perfection, we haven't addressed yet, is it's incredibly important and very interesting to me. Um, Oscar Wilde wrote once that a map of the world that didn't include utopia wouldn't be worth glancing at. I used to think that was a, a wonderful statement, and I'm now very unsure uh, of it indeed. I think it, it may be seductive, and certainly the idea of just doing without the idea of utopia when constructing your map makes you feel you've lost something, possibly something rather beautiful. Nonetheless, be, maybe a seduction into something very deadly. Um, the idea of teleology, of the possibility of, of a radiant and almost ultimate future, is a very hard one to drop. I spent a lot of my life as a member of a Marxist organization. I learned a lot from that. A lot of it was well worth knowing. But as I gradually transcended and began to discard at least some of it, trying to salvage what I could and make use of it, I think the giving up of the teleological was almost the hardest. It's a very hard thing for people to do, to say perhaps we're not going to arrive at a point where I would know enough to tell you with real authority what you should do. In other words, I would become the subject rather than the object of that, that sentence about the sure and the certain. I'm pretty sure, pretty certain, in fact, that I won't ever know enough to be in that position, and no one should trust me if I ever looked as if I was going to. Um, the beauty and the interest, the consuming beauty and interest of the struggle to master science and philosophy and physics and, and the extraordinary new and, and wonderful discoveries that we're making. Just the preoccupation with those, with those enormous questions is more than enough for a lifetime, much more than enough. And it's, I think, a shame that for many people it takes almost a lifetime to find that out. Okay. So we've got about uh, 15 to 20 minutes here, or slightly longer. Um, and I would ask you to keep your questions relatively economical and to the point, and you can either address them to either one of our debaters or we'll get both uh, to answer the question. So I'm seeing a hand over here, and then I'll go back there. Yes, sir. Okay. So um, the gentleman... Okay. Um, the, the gentleman says he's not a scholar, um, 
<laughs> but his question, uh, to, to, I think, to both of you is, uh, I'll start with you, Professor Brummett, is there enough art to pay for, I guess, to justify uh, the lives that have been lost in the name of religion? Well, the, um, the proposition, of course, asks about culture. It doesn't ask about art, which is one of the points I wanted to, to make. Uh, um, Well, but 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 the shirt you have on, and that's culture, you know. Um, and well, it's a wonderful shirt. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, just a marvelous thing, and, and I'm better for it. Um, <laughs> I I don't think you can I don't think you can tot all that up because you you'll never get it all on the same scale. Um, uh, let, me, let me rephrase the question, which is, is it the same thing about religion that's producing the Inquisition that also produces art and culture? Is it the same thing? If so, then that question makes more sense. If it's different aspects of religion, then I think we would be um, justified in saying let's try to work against whatever it was that produced the Inquisition and let's try to encourage whatever it was that, that uh, uh, produces art and culture, including your very fine shirt, um, and, and, um, and, and separate that out. Um, I'll let Mr. Hitchens. Okay, Mr. Hitchens. On, did well, yes, I mean, I think I, I, I'm an answer is particularly um, expected of me, exacted of me, because if there's a confusion here, it must be my fault. I, I didn't want to set up a, a false dichotomy between religion and culture, or, I'm sorry, religion, culture and religion here, in the sense of saying they were mutually exclusive, any more than I would say that you couldn't have one without the other. What I hoped we would do, certainly what I hope we provoke people to thinking about, is this, is to find out what the, what the best contingencies are in which culture flourishes to see if faith um, is one of those. And if it is not, if it is found that uh, culture will be, will be, can be produced without faith and without the political systems and social systems that go with it, most of them tending to be tyrannical, then that would be a very great thing. And that's why I adduced the example of the Parthenon. Because, for example, I'm, I've been to many of the other monuments of antiquity. Um, I've been to Babylon. I mean, to Baalbek, to Karnak, um, I've been to the Great Zimbabwe ruins in Africa. So it's, it's very hard to visit them without being acutely aware they were built by slaves. Somehow it shows they're built to impose, to impress, to show who's in charge. And that, for me, takes away their cultural contribution a little bit, just a little bit, but an important bit, in the way the Parthenon does not. The Parthenon is light and open and is the work of many hands directed by superb cultural and artistic producers. If we take a very pressing contemporary example, um, what would you say, I'll ask my own question, but what would you say the culture of Persia used to be best known for? What do we owe to Persia human, in terms of human culture? Well, the poetry of Hafez and of Omar Khayyam, um, quite probably the discovery of sherbet, um, the making of wonderful wine in Shiraz, one of the finest uh, wines ever produced, the games of backgammon and chess. If we can have shirts, Professor, and I agree with you that culture is very wide, I think we have to include these as human achievements too. Now all of these are actually specifically negated by the idea that Iran needs faith in order to have a culture. All of the things I've just, all of the wonderful things that I've just mentioned, and they're by no means exhaustive, are repressed, um, disfigured, um, sent into exile as far as is possible by those who know they are right, by those who already know that they have all the information that they need, by those who already have all the uh, moral authority that could possibly be, be needed. This is a terrible situation. It's made more terrible by the 
increasingly likely prospect that people who know they're right, this to address the perfection question, Professor Grummet, are about to become the possessors of apocalyptic weaponry, or if they're not already. Because then we really will find out whether culture can survive for religion or not. And it'll be a real, it already is a very pressing question for our time. Okay. Thank you for the question and thank both great answers. Um, by the way, if, if I may speak as a member of the tribe, um, one of the cultural, uh, you forgot the two cultural contrib contributions of the Persians, uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, romance and pistachios as well. Oh, right. um, pistachio, the pistachio industry is now run by Mr. Rafson Johnny himself. <laughs> Private monopoly of one of the clerics. Uh, 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 in the green shirt on, uh, over there, yes. Um, uh, Mr. Hitchens, uh, uh, since you ha I have the mic, uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I think we all really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to ask, since you have spoken and written in the past about the value of transcendent experience, um, obviously religion and transcendent experience seems to be tied in, to, a strong, to a great degree. And I'm wondering, in terms of the cultural impacts of transcendent experience, what do we risk losing, or do we risk losing anything by potentially losing religion? Thank you. Well done. Good. Okay. Well, you, you rather invite, thank you, by the way, for your kind words, you rather invite my answer, I think, here, which is certainly, I would not find trustworthy somebody who professed themselves to be indifferent uh, to the extent of saying that they'd never had a spiritual or an ecstatic moment. Um, I think that if I, you know, people who would be indifferent to the combination of landscape, music, um, love, possibly the wines of Shiraz, all the things celebrated, in fact, by the great Sir Makayam, um, I, would, I would find that person to be somewhat null. I would, I would suspect them of, a, of, a, of an indifference that I wouldn't want to find in a, in a friend or in anyone with intellectual curiosity, but I think there's a huge difference between acknowledging the idea of a cosmos that's larger than we can know or ever will know or can imagine and the distant refraction of that idea through experiences, whether they're eros or, or landscape or poetry, the ecstatic. Every, there's all the difference in the world between that and regularly prostrating yourself or sinking to your knees and repeating an incantation in the hope that the more you say it, the more true it's likely to become. That, by contrast, seems to me to be completely banal. Someone just sent me for a review a very interesting book by, called Confessions of a Buddhist Atheist. Someone who, very serious person who spent a long time as a Buddhist, meditating, practicing, proselytizing. Buddhists, in theory, don't do that, but they do, in fact. Um, around the world, understands it very well, got a lot out of it, but says you know, it can only go on contributing now if it gives up a couple of ideas, one of them being the, the idea of dharma, the sort of obliteration of the mind, especially of that as being a good idea, and second, the very cruel and fatalistic concept of reincarnation. Again, I think without those two things, it would hardly be recognizable as Buddhism. But clearly, there's something worth saving from a cult or a movement, let's not call it a religion if you don't want to, um, that does believe in meditation, that believes in intense reflection. I think it's quite possible to divorce that from the, super, from the superstitious, from a belief in the supernatural, and above all, from the incantation through prayer of the influence of a supreme dictator, of a sort of celestial Kim Jong-il, a, a dear leader who can't be got rid of. Thank you, Mr. Hitchens. Uh, if I can beg the indulgence of... Uh, we are coming to the end of our scheduled time. If it's okay with you two, the debaters, if we take two more questions and then have closing statements, is that okay with you, Mr. Hitchens? I would honestly rather have more questions. Okay. Well, then... Meaning, how long can you join us for? <laughs> it's your call. I, I, I'm actually not in that much of a hurry. Okay, um, well, fantastic. I feel, I feel and like Professor Brummett?
Well, then we can take more questions. Is there a, um, I see uh, a couple of people, I'm just wondering if there's a, 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 any women who have questions to maintain some sort of gender balance. Yes, over here. And then I'll come up there. Uh, this could be for either of you, but uh, in particular, Mr. Hitchens, I was trying to imagine uh, being in the position of somebody who would argue that religion has been a positive force on our culture, and I was trying to imagine what they might ask you. And what I was thinking was, well, if we don't have something like religion or perhaps um, a heaven or something like that to believe in or inspire us to do well in this world, maybe to inquire after things, um, what does do that for us if we don't have religion for you? Yes, indeed. I mean, just as I think that um, if you say, as I do, that religion, um, sorry, that morality, uh, ethics, morality, can't be derived from proclamations from on high. You can't get them in ten-tablet form. That, that belief of mine surely obliges me to say, well, then, how do we get them? Because we clearly do have the requirement for the answer to the question, how do we live a just life? What are our responsibilities to others? What would the good life be? Um, and why is it that we, these questions are important to us? Well, look, I think the answer is a fairly easy one. I hope not deceptively so. Human solidarity requires it of us. We wouldn't be here having this conversation if we didn't have in our species an innate need to help others, not just for our own sake, though helping others can, of course, lead to benefits for the helper, but because it's positively a pleasurable thing to do. Now, there's no need for any belief in the supernatural, um, in my opinion, to uh, justify that. It's, it's, it's a sine qua non of being human. Civilizations that don't do this or species that don't do it or can't do it, simply won't develop. Um, we're only half a chromosome away, but we can still laugh at the chimpanzees because they never got to the stage where they could respect any unit higher than their immediate family, and not even that very well, and that out of a very blunt self-interest. We are able, by using what I won't call altruism, but the need to help, the need to give blood, for example, something I like to do. I can't do it anymore, unfortunately, but I do it for various reasons. One, I have a rare blood group, um, and one day I might need some myself. In fact, I recently did. Um, two, um, I'm not really giving anything away. Someone else is getting a pint, but the pint I give them will be replenished with a nice cup of hot tea in a very short time. And third, because it makes me feel happy. It, it makes me feel good to do a stranger a favor. Um, that may be simple, but I hope it's not simplistic. Professor Bremont, did you, did you want to chime in on that? It's a good question. Yeah. Um... I certainly agree with Mr. Hitchens, but I'm not sure that altruism has given rise to any great art. I can't think of any at the moment, but perhaps I'm wrong. I, I was thinking about that question in light of the previous question. I was thinking about transcendence, and this, I'm just going to put this out there quickly and then sit down because this may be opening a whole new can of worms, but it seems to me that, that every age uh, to produce great art or even great culture, even great everyday culture, has to have some sort of framework that provides that kind of transcendent experience and, and that truly great art, truly great culture, even everyday culture, ha has to come from that. Now, we live in an increasingly secular world, so I, I think um, that the, uh, uh, the problems that Mr. Hitchens uh, complains of um, I, I, I think, I hope, I believe that they are becoming less and less and less. But the question then becomes, uh, what, um, if, if religion, however you define it, is no longer providing that sort of transcendent motivation or framework, um, the reason why people make art, the, the motivation for art, the thing that gives meaning to art and culture, um, then what does for us, what does provide that, that kind of uh, transcendence? 
Um, let me just suggest that I think increasingly it's going to be the market. Uh, as, as global capitalism takes over culture uh, worldwide, uh, like it or not, but I think, I think that may be a, a new framework and in a hundred years people may be uh, discussing the extremism of, uh, of capitalism. So I'll just throw that out and then sit down. <laughs> that does lead to a whole, whole other series of questions. That's very provocative. Uh, um, okay, let me try and get somebody up top there. I'm not going to throw the mic up there, but you can just tell me. Yeah, sir, go ahead. Okay. Uh, let me try and uh, give, do that justice. Um, Mr. Hitchens, by the way, this questioner has traveled 500 miles from Washington, D.C. And... <laughs> <laughs> So, it's a bit of an irony. Uh, his, um, <laughs> uh, he mentions Thomas Paine and the notion that nothing could be more divine than the natural sciences. A question to both of you. How has religion, he sa says, potentially stifled the natural sciences? Um, well, everybody knows the story of, of what happened to people who tried to expand scientific knowledge. The more the sciences shed light, the less room there is for people to say miracles can be prayed for that will achieve the same effect in healthcare, say. Or that bad miracles, bad supernatural, but not supernatural, bad events in the natural order, like hurricanes or earthquakes, are the product of sin. All the things that made religion possible in the years when it was building itself up are kicked away. Now there is now a whole school of, of religious types who follow us around saying, ah, now we, we've stopped saying that the theory of relativity isn't true. We've stopped saying that the Big Bang would be a heresy. We've stopped saying that all species were created in the, at the same time and for the same reason. Instead, it's just occurred to us, evolution is so intricate, so wonderful, so marvelous, so complex, it could only have been done by God. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> this is not really... This is not really a theory of knowledge, is it? It's, there's no kind of epistemology involved. It's just a catch-up. Um, and uh, uh, contemptible, I, I think. Where, that's where they have given in. Where they haven't, and a surprisingly large number of places, including in the United States, where they haven't, they, till, they still attempt to um, inhibit the circulation of those discoveries. And I think there's a final closing reason why it, un it unsettles them. There's nothing so much to do with scientific implications, it's this. If you take a look through the Hubble telescope at the photographs it's sending back, for example, or if you read a page of the work of Stephen Hawking, I can only read about one page of him a day and hope to make progress, you'll come across considerations that are so much more awe-inspiring, so much more overwhelming, so much more inclined to induce in you feelings of extreme modesty, um, awareness of what should be your humility, and so much more grand and, and wonderful than anything that any religion could possibly come up with. Do you know about the event horizon, can I just tell you? I mean, someone, I'm sure many people in the audience do. It's the lip of the black hole. Um, if you travel towards a black hole, you went over its lip, as it were, in, into it. We have to do this in pictographic terms, of course, because we're so limited in our language. As you went over that, it's called the event horizon. You would, in theory, be able to see the unfolding of the, of the past and the unfolding of the future as well as the present. I say in theory, because even if you could get there, you probably wouldn't have time uh, in which to do that. But it's a thought, and actually one of Hawking's colleagues has said, to him, if he ever finds out that he's terminally ill, um, that's the way he wants to die. Now you look at that, the, the incredible majesty of that thought and that spectacle, and you set it against what? The burning bush? I don't think so. It makes, it makes the, 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 the so-called miraculous the super, the supernatural achievements of religion seem what they are, completely trivial the products of village squabbles in the, in the Bronze Age. So of course there is 
uh, 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 an enduring incompatibility between those two ways of looking at the world. Okay. Uh, I, I, thank you for that, Mr. Hitchens. Okay. Uh, two more, and then we, um, I'm going to come to this man, because he's got a very strident... Uh, uh, yeah, let's... Yeah, go, go, can you... Uh, do you want to... Can you get down here? And I'll give you the last question. I'll go to this woman here. Everyone says this, but this everyone says this, but this is for both speakers. In a discussion that we've heard so much about the dangers of extremism, I would like to hear more about tolerance. Start with you, Professor Remick. Well, I think tolerance can can be it can be a good thing. It can also be very much misplaced. I think the I think rather than, than tolerance, I, I'd rather have wisdom, because I think wisdom will do what tolerance would otherwise do. And um, again, back to the hobby horse I rode in here on, I, I think that a rhetorical training uh, is, is more inclined to provide that wisdom, where if one hears what we might call an intolerant statement, just saying to yourself, well, be tolerant, be tolerant, because perhaps it's, a sta it's perhaps the statement is true. There are some things of which we ought not to be tolerant. I think it's a wiser course of action to ask what ought we to affirm and what ought we to critique, and I think that will produce a better world. I think there's an indissoluble element of um, patronization and uh, condescension in the idea of tolerance. I mean, would you like it if I said, I'll tolerate you? Would you not feel, well, thanks a lot, who asked you? <laughs> Do I need your permission um, uh, to, to exist or to say what I say? I think I, I would rather assume you're right to do that. Then it would depend what you said. Um, it's like being forgiven. Mother Teresa once said she forgave me. I thought, that's supposed to sound nice, but I didn't ask her for forgiveness. Hadn't actually done anything that required me to do so. And I'm not completely sure what gives her the power to bestow it in any case. Again, a tremendously serene condescension on the part of someone who wasn't as modest as she looked. You notice, by the way, that the most faithful people are the ones who go on the most about humility and being how humble and how modest they are. I said, no, no, just fine, don't pay attention to me. I'm just going around doing God's work all the time. I'm, on, I'm carrying out his instructions. It's okay, I hope I'm, just, I'm not getting in your way. Um, that's not very modest, is it? There's no humility there. That's a tremendously arrogant claim. In the reign of Queen Elizabeth um, I, the great Queen Bess, an attempt was made to put an end to religious warfare in Britain, in other words, the killing of Christians by Christians over what Christianity was or was not. And the legislation that tried to bring it to an end was called the Toleration Act, um, whereby some sects of Christianity were told that henceforth they'd be tolerated. Again, I think that's an insufferable way to be spoken to. And just because I don't want to and refrain from joining in the applause for the much too inclusive uh, statement that Professor Bromit just made. Um, I would say that many statements made by the religious are intolerable. I don't think it is tolerable that people be told, excuse me, that children be told by their parents or by their teachers that if they don't obey certain religious precepts, they will go to hell or that they can congratulate themselves that they won't go to hell, but that their neighbors or schoolmates who practice another religion most certainly will. I think that's intolerable. I think it's antisocial. I think those who say, as was said about 10 years ago, uh, to Americans by Osama bin Laden, we can always call off this attack on you, if you like. We can cease denouncing you as a bunch of... Um, of corrupt hedonists run by the international Jewish conspiracy given to full-time offenses against chastity, um, the vermin and scum of the earth, 
meet to be killed, fit to be killed any time or any place in the name of God, we can always call it off if you'd like to become Muslim. Then we can accept you completely. And he's repeatedly said in his broadcasts, which I'm glad to see have now come to a terminus, that, that that showed how broad-minded he was. After all, he said, I warned them and I gave them an offer. They could prostrate themselves in front of me or they could be considered legitimate targets. Well, that's his view of being tolerant and that's my definition of the intolerable. A final question to my brother over here. Not really my brother, but... Um, this is a question to, to Professor Brummett. Uh, you mentioned um, culture being more just an art. Um, uh, you mentioned a person working in a soup kitchen, for example, and I would say that uh, um, isn't your view of what culture is a more secular view than what it would have been, uh, say, 100 years ago, and that culture, the simple street culture, uh, being... Uh, you know, imposed on people by religion itself. Thank you. Well, there's no doubt that, that we're becoming, we, the world, um, uh, is becoming more secular. And so, a hundred years ago, I think one might not have worked in a soup kitchen without some sort of religious justification. And today, of course, people work in soup kitchens for all kinds of justifications, not necessarily religious ones. I guess what I was trying to say is I think it is possible, though, that uh, there are many people who work in soup kitchens uh, or engage in all manner of cultural practices uh, who do so um, because of their religious or spiritual convictions. And, and the point that I was trying to make was that if we're going to tot up um, the number of, of uh, innocents uh, slaughtered by religion as against the number of uh, sculpt sculptures that are made by religion, uh, which of course is an impossible task, then I think we also need to think about um, the production of, of everyday culture, of everyday art, uh, which is sort of the dark matter of, of culture that, that we've been talking about. Um, and, and I think, I just, my point was that that needs to be included in this um, still impossible task of weighing. Um, on the, Did on you want to? Go ahead. Well, go, go I, ahead. I, I, I don't know if the question was directed to me or not. I do have an answer if it was. I, I think we can take an answer from you. Yes, go ahead. Um, it's very, very frequently argued against my position. Look at all the good works that uh, religious people do. And I must say, I don't think it even deserves to be called an argument. I mean, isn't it the case, and are we incessantly told, and isn't it in fact true, I know it to be true, that Hamas, for example, is the welfare agency for many impoverished Palestinians? As far as I know, that claim isn't completely void. Or is it, I've seen it happen, in fact, with Hezbollah too in um, South Lebanon. Let's not deny it. They, they do try and provide a safety net for people, and uh, of course in return for political support and dragooning, but doesn't alter the fact that Hamas and Hezbollah are totalitarian organizations wedded to violence and to racism. On their websites you can read reproductions, literal straight out reproductions of the protocols of the elders of Zion. The attempt to get back into the mainstream, an anti-Semitic fabrication that was the Bible, if you like, of the Nazi party and before that of the Russian Orthodox right wing, who are the people who actually put it together. The, the, the charity work and the political and religious work seem to me either incompatible, excuse me, either, either irrelevant to each other, or the one is supposed to be an excuse for the other, which I think wouldn't wash. Um, Mormons, for example, will always tell you how great the work of their missionaries is in Africa. Why are they telling me this? All I said to them was, your religion is based on a forgery by a well-known conjurer and fraud who claimed to have found gold plates from God in a hole in upstate New York. People who believe in it are deluded. Um, it also, uh, for a very long time, refused to admit that uh, black people had souls 
or could join the church in any real capacity. Only amended that view just in time for the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the point of fact, which casts doubt, I think, on how sincere its repudiation was. So you have missionary work as well. I'm sorry to hear it if it's spreading that garbage. Um, now, the, the Roman Catholic Church, which, which boasts of its charities, Catholic charity is a big deal anywhere you go in the world, where I often do to see the work of groups like Médecins Sans Frontières or UNICEF or many other excellent organizations that are completely secular and do the work for its own sake and are not proselytizing while they do so, which to me makes them superior deliverers of charity you will find the Catholic Church's work as well. But I would trade every dime they spend for just a couple of small things, that the Church would drop its opposition to birth control, that, that, which is the, the real cause of poverty in the world, is the refusal to allow women control over their reproduction. We have a cure for poverty. It's known as the empowerment of women. The Catholic Church stands four square against it and leads to untold and incalculable suffering that a lifetime of charitable work won't help them to make up. And then I think I would ask them also to add that one day, one day they'll want to, one day they'll want to criticize themselves for having said that while AIDS may be very bad, um, condoms are much worse. A positively wicked statement with absolutely appalling consequences for the health and welfare of millions of people. So the more they try and drag up the soup kitchen, the more they're going to regret it. Well, um, this has been a really, really, really interesting evening and a most enlightening one. And uh, I have to thank, um, um, first of all, uh, Professor Bar Bar Barry Brummett, who's up here from Austin, Texas. Um, your presentation was um, sophisticated, enlightening, much more than a hobby horse. And we thank you very much for, for being up here with us. Today. And if I may, as I understand the story goes, um, when, uh, when we found out just a few weeks ago or not so long ago that Christopher Hitchens wouldn't be able to come here in person, there was some talk of, well, canceling the event, he may not be in, in good enough health, and he insisted that he still wanted to do the event. And sir, you look great. I mean, and energized, and it is fantastic to have you be part of this. Thank you, Christopher Hitchens. I don't know if you can see the audience standing, but if I could, if I could package them and send you to, them to you that way, that's what's happening here, sir. Thank you for this. Very, very kind of you. I do appreciate it, really. Thanks. Thank you to the University of Waterloo, Shelley, Fraser, all the, uh, the provost, all the, all the folks who put this together. Congrats to the English department on your 50th anniversary. Thank you all for having me, and good night. <laughs>